today uh, we're going to talk about um, what it takes to uh, change your mindset and transition to regenerative farming um, and how that shifts your relationship with the land um, and the sort of experiments, the adaptations um, and all the mistakes and fails that you might uh, make and, and how you um, sort of start to learn and move forward and then the tools that you can use to support um, you with that. And uh, we've got some great panellists as well. So uh, we're welcoming Caroline uh, Grindrod um, from, from Roots of Nature um, and Wilderculture, and also Claire from FAI Farms, um, and Sam and Claire Beaumont from um, Galbraith in the Lake District. Um, and I'm Annie, so just a quick intro. Uh, I um, work for VidaCycle, and we um, make a, a soil health monitoring app called Soil Mentor. Um, and also a few other apps as well. Um, and I also manage a farm um, called Hampton Gay Farm um, near Oxford. And uh, we are regenerative here. And we have cattle and pigs. Um, but I'll hand it over now to uh, Caroline to introduce herself. Thanks, Annie. And wow, what a great turnout. It's lovely to see so many people here. And um, thanks for joining us. So yeah, my name is Caroline Grindra. And I am a, I, oh, I'm not sure what my title is anymore, but I am a consultant and, and coach in regenerative uh, livestock systems. But my background is kind of comes through environmental conservation and ecology and then into hill farming, managed a hill farm. And um, I then have sort of several areas of work. One is the Roots of Nature Consultancy, which represents a whole range of work from working with large food organizations right through to individual farms and helping to de design and train and coach in you know, bespoke regenerative systems. Um, I am the co-founder and director of an organization called Wilderculture, which is sort of answering the question of, how do we do regenerative agriculture um, in the uplands and, and where does that intersect with rewilding, which in interestingly we've got a session on later as well. And I'm also the founder and uh, co-director of a 100% grass-fed meat business called Primal Meats. Um, but today, I guess my main role that I'm, I'm sort of speaking from, if you like, is this idea of um, you know supporting people in the transition to regenerative um, farming or systems. Thanks, Sunny. Uh, great. And um, actually, if we'd go to Claire now, and I'm going to share a few photos while you're doing your intro as well, so you get a bit of context with farms. So I'm just going to share my screen and show a slideshow, but Claire, if you want to kick off. Okay, thank you. Um, hi, everyone. Yeah, Claire Hill from FAI Farms. Uh, FAI is a food business consultancy um, in the main and we, we have a number of data systems as well that support our consulting work um, but we work with big food brands um, McDonald's, um, Ikea, Marks and Spencer um, in, and uh, others across Europe and the world and, and the UK and ultimately what we're doing is uh, supporting them on their sourcing and supply chains. It started off 20 years ago about uh, mostly focused on animal welfare and we moved through the sustainability era and now we're into a kind of regeneration and what that looks like for for their supply chains and um, we central to everything we do is the 1200 acre farm of which you can see some beautiful pictures of on the screen 1200 acres just outside oxford that we um are for our tenants on oxford university and a few other um landowners around um and and we're, we're on a classic 16 year fbt um with with oxford university um and so we farm the land we run the farm commercially, um, although we we do have um, we do run trials as well. But we're not we don't get paid to do farming. We, the farming has to wipe its face, and then we um, we, we get supported um, for the projects that we run. And our um, for certainly my anyway most exciting and fundamental project to date has been um, the transformation from organic to regenerative, um, which we started about five or six years ago when without really realizing that's what we were starting when we decided we wanted to try and um, remove grain from our um, 
our diets and then we we've, we've ended up going through a full regenerative transition um, and that has sparked lots of interest um, from all over the world in in what and how we do it um, and that's what we're going to kind of talk about today so I'll stop talking now because I realize I'm going into details I'll stop <laughs> um, and if we hand it over to Sam and Claire um, and we'll show a few pictures from mm. you guys as well Thanks, Annie. Um, so I'm Claire Beaumont, um, and we're at Gabra Hall Farm um, in the Lake District. And you can see a picture of pretty much the whole farm there. Um, just a bit of background. So I, I grew up on this farm, um, and my, my grandparents um, have been there since the late 70s. And um, so while I was growing up, it was very much my granddad who was farming it. Um, fairly conventionally, similar to everyone else in, in the valley and in the Lake District. Um, he, he died in the late 90s and my, um, my parent, well, my mum and my uncle, um, well, my mum certainly wasn't interested in farming and um, was kind of encouraged not to farm and go and get a degree in law. Um, my uncle was in a wheelchair, so couldn't farm, so he became an accountant. So since the late 90s, the farm's been, um, it's been let to graziers, um, mostly sheep farmers along the valley. Um, I was similarly encouraged not to go into farming to go and get a degree. So I, I um, left home, became an engineer and was um, doing that for 10, 10 years. Um, and handily is where I met Sam, who, uh, who married and fortunately is also interested in farming like I was. And so in 2019, um, the two of us decided to, to come back to um, 2017. 2017. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, and um, my parents were quite willing to, to let us sort of give it a go. Um, and we kind of, oh, well, I'll let Sam, um, oh, well, maybe I'll, I'll give a chance to Sam <laughs> to talk, <laughs> to explain where, where we've been since um, 2017. Yeah, so we. Um... So we, we sort of started out in a similar fashion to, to Claire's, um, Claire's granddad. Really, we we had a twelve elf sheep, um, and we we did we had we had a few shorthorn cows at the beginning, um, but after a couple of years, it was it was pretty clear that it wasn't wasn't really going to work um, financially. But also, we were increasingly sort of concerned about the fertilizer costs uh, and the impact of that on the environment and the feed uh, that we were using. And so we decided to, to transition at uh, around that point. I won't, I won't, I guess I shouldn't go into too much detail until sort of later on, but now we've basically got a herd of shorthorn cattle, um, about 50 head now, and we're out wintering. Um, we've got a small um, number of pigs, four Cooney Cooney pigs and some fell ponies um, to run alongside them. And um, yeah, it's been an incredible journey full of sort of, ups and downs but just um you know we're learning every day and um yeah it's just it's really exciting um to be part of what feels like a sort of growing movement um, um in farming we're working so, yeah. with um world culture um and caroline um so our transition to regenerative agriculture um is, is called wilder galbra and it's we've adopted the world culture um approach so and um, which we'll go into a bit more I think that's great, actually. Thank you. Um, well, actually, we're with you, Sam and Claire. You mentioned actually the triggers that you um, really sort of made you think, "Wow, I need to change my farming system." And I guess that. So maybe if we do actually talk a bit more about that now and what that sort of very first trigger was, was it the cost of nitrogen, um, and or was what what sort of really started your mindset shift? Well, for me, um, my my family's farms in Derbyshire, and I kind of had, had I had some experience of farming prior to moving up to Cumbria because um, my parents were organic um, sheep farmers, um, and I could see that there was a lot of negativity in the media about you know the, the impact of, of meat on the planet, and um, you know I, I just wasn't comfortable going down a route where we were reliant on on feed um, and fertilizer. So we, I just, at that point, I, I, yeah, I just, I wasn't happy with it. And that combined with 
the fact that we were just not getting, um, we, yeah, we just weren't making any money really out of mm -hmm. sheep, um, which kind of led me to try and desperately think of different ways of farming. I was quite inspired by um, rewilding in a way because I thought, you know, the, the, the biodiversity loss, um, the soil degradation, all of the, the massive challenges that we're facing, um, you know, and, and what they did at NEP, I, I thought was was pretty incredible. But at the same time, I, I wanted to produce food and and you know lots of food, so I, I couldn't work out how to kind of do both. And that was where I guess talking to to Caroline really helped uh, to try and sort of come up with a plan for our farm and to define a, 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 our context, um, which I think is the key thing. And it's not the same for everybody. It has to be something that's that's relevant for you and, and what and motivates you and um, you know has to you have to get out of bed in the morning and really want to do what you do um, and that is the, the key thing for me i think it was certainly because we as i said did the same thing as my granddad did for a couple of years we could we were doing that but then we could quite quickly see that however much we tried to retune and refine what we were doing um, we were still competing with the generations of sheep farmers that were known in the valley and we kind of needed to carve out a niche for ourselves because we were never you know we actually worked out even if we were to get prices not the top prices but similar price to those who were well established we still couldn't see how we could make a strong business out of it and um, so we kind of that's where that's kind of triggered us to start looking elsewhere as alternative ways that we could farm yeah, that must have been quite a tough, tough realization as well. <laughs> I think, I suppose, because I, I wonder, Claire, at FAI, did you kind of get to that tough moment where you thought, wow, something's got to change or something's got to give? Yeah, I think there wasn't one. There was a few, and um, the one, the one was the, the the concrete one where we would we'd done we'd started doing some more rotational grazing we were growing more grass and that was great like thought oh brilliant we're on our way on our well on our way to becoming pasture only but um and and we worked out we modeled like how many animals we could cope with during the grazing season that was like great everyone's really excited about being able to have more animals and then of course it was a well i was like well what, yeah but what about the winter i was like well, yeah no you need to build a new shed and we're tent farm um i knew that if i went to the other <laughs> shareholders in the business and said oh yeah we need uh you know 150 grand because we're going to put up a cow shed and well what's that going to allow you to do well to have a few more cows well what's the return on investment well it just kind of allows us to stand still really there's a few more cattle sales but same sort of thing it doesn't really change the game financially and of course with a new shed it's more tractors more straw more scraping up more manure more everything so i just had this kind of moment where i stood there and i was like the answer to us becoming more sustainable cannot be more concrete like concrete cannot be the answer and that's that was one of the 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 triggers um and the other was the i think it, um, maybe just claire and sam talking there it's that i definitely had people often talk about this treadmill feeling and i definitely had that with the sheep like um it was a, it was a treadmill of flooding at lambing lifting sheep off cramming them into um buildings that at, in the winter when it was too wet for them to be out that aren't suitable like the buildings on our farm are really old dilapidated poor ventilation so we've got them all like putting sheep inside and saying yeah, this doesn't feel right and the same thing as well looking at so we've got all the sheep inside i mean man as soon as you put sheep inside your your, your money that you know, <laughs> any potential money that was there that's gone uh and 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 then um and looking around at the farm going, got all this land here but we can't put any animals on because all of this middle block of dry-ish land is arable. And so what we're doing is we're, we've got, we're cultivating this, we're organic, so we have to cultivate it to stay on top of the weeds. And so we're, we're cultivating it, we're making straw. That's great because then we're now, we're now we're feeding the straw and the grain to the sheep in the shed. Whereas if this fields were growing things that the sheep could eat and could be on during the winter, then we could just have the sheep out and all of that effort and cost um just goes away and it's like oh that, that was another light bulb I was like oh, if we just transfer all of that and then I started to really think about the carbon footprint of it all like the the tractor energy the time the effort everything that's going into it so that was those were my two um kind of things that when I was I had no answers then but I was like something needs to change um after doing 
multiple lambings in floods and lifting sheep off and just thinking this every year oh it'll have to be drier next year but the reality of our new world is not dry it's just wetter it will just get wetter and so we need yeah. to change something it sounds about all right it's been so wet lately <laughs> um so enter caroline and it'd be great to hear a bit about how you've worked um with both fai and, and galbra and 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 the triggers that you've seen and you know they're then taking those first steps yeah, it's great to hear their stories, isn't it? And obviously I work very closely with Claire and uh, Sam and Claire as well. So um, and just Annie, I'm being told I've got an unstable connection. So let me know if it, things get really bad. But um, yeah, so it's interesting, isn't it? We often hear about the kind of the, the regen greats that we have all read and how they came to it and their mindset shift happened because they had some major disaster or you know it, the, the farm burnt or th you know three seasons of hail that wrecked all their crops and what have you and and they were literally on their knees and 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 that's when they had this kind of aha moment and of course wouldn't it be nice if we can get to the point where we don't people don't have to get to that stage before they can so I guess my main interest at the moment and my focus is all around you know how do we help support farmers so that they don't have to go through that crash and burn phase and we can actually transition a little bit more elegantly to a, a, a different paradigm and and I guess that's it is a cliche and everyone says it but you know regenerative um is you you are operating within a completely different paradigm you have to have a different worldview and my lineage of, of how I work is with um, holistic management I'm an accredited professional with the Savory Institute so I use their framework for managing complexity as the kind of the backdrop and the frame for everything that I do whether I'm working with big companies or um, you know individual farmers like um, Sam and Claire and um, so it, because you're operating in a, a regenerative par paradigm and a holistic perspective and worldview, everything's different. So whereas once upon a time I have thought of myself and called myself a consultant, and I still, I still do to some degree because people find it hard to understand what I do otherwise, but I'm much less thinking of myself as a consultant in the kind of the more conventional um, paradigm that agriculture has been operating in, where you hire somebody, they come along, they tell you what to do. And then you follow their instructions or if it's an environmental scheme, you follow the prescriptions in the scheme and then somebody might turn up a few years later and see if it's worked. Um, it's absolutely not that. And, and how I work is much more of a trainer. I train initially in the principles of, of kind of agroecology and, and regenerative agriculture and holistic management. So the principles of how ecosystems work. Um, and I really try and get them to see the, their farm and, and you know, everything, the, the, the ecology differently. And then it's once we've gone through that kind of, we need some sort of basic immersive training in order to have that kind of mindset shift and looking at things differently. So that is usually a two or three day course. And I've got a few different ways of doing that. And I either work individually with a, a farm or an estate or basic training of holistic management in some other version. Um, so people have to go through the, learning those principles. And then really my job after that is, is helping them. Now they can see things differently, helping them create a bespoke, what we call it a context, you know, a plan, goals, a way of working with your farm. And so, you know, I often liken it to the idea that, you know, we've often got this idea, oh, I want to be regenerative without really thinking about what does that look like and what does that mean for me? And, and everyone will have heard about the triple bottom line. We've got to make sure we're balancing, you know, the not only are we trying to regenerate the ecosystem and, and be profitable farmers, but we've also got to yeah make a profit. It's got to stand on its own two feet with, you know, economically. And it's also really important that it's got to be right for those people. It's got to be right for your family, your stage of life, whether you've got kids, whether, you know, you've got big ambitions, um, you know, something's got to drive you to want to get up and, and get on in the morning. So we've got to make sure that that's totally embedded in that. So so we work, we work quite a lot on, on developing this this context. And I often use the analogy of um, if you, my husband's a, a builder. So if, if, if somebody came to him and said, I want you to build me a hotel, um, you know, it, he would not even know where to start. You know, you couldn't make any good decisions around that process until you've decided what type of hotel is this going to be is it going to be a luxury boutique hotel with huge rooms private chefs and you know um, fancy bathrooms and, and swimming pools and all the rest of it or is it going to be a kind of a bargain basement hostel with um, a vending machine and and you know a shared bathroom so you can't go you know, we very rarely in farming do any work around what is this what is this thing that we're trying to create or or you know manage um, so you know, until you've actually really gone, you know, into detail thinking about 
you know, what is this hotel going to look like? What is it? What is the experience we're trying to create from people staying in this? Then, you know, you cannot make a decision about the, the you know, what size of the bedrooms, how we're going to build it, you know, what staff do we need to hire, you know, um, you know, what uh, any of those decisions around, you know, buying sweets or fabrics or anything else. That's your daily farming decisions that we're trying to make without having this big sort of plan of, of where we're trying to get to. So I guess my job is to help create that plan. But you can only create that plan when you've changed the mindset so you can see how this ecology might work. Um, and then it's really a process of ongoing coaching and support to help test the decisions. So it's those day to day decisions of, you know, um, what should we plant here? How should we do our grazing planning? Should we, you know, buy more cows and sell them, you, you know, the sheep? You know, all of those decisions, you can't make those decisions well until you've got this, this big fit, the big vision. So that's very much my role, I think, is, and I, I tend to not, um, I, I work with a, a few farms, not many, um, and I have a, a deeper, longer relationship with those people generally and um, so I can kind of give an offer or ongoing support so yeah that's how how I work and that's kind of how I see regenerative you know and, and of course there is consultants that are able to come in and be pulled in on specialisms and and you know you can't know everything I think my role is more seeing the big picture supporting in the in the transition and then trying to find the right people with the really the really clever people with the specialisms and the technical stuff that we can then bring in to help you know c confirm and, and help make those decisions so yeah Great. Yeah, so it's really all about the people. Um, Sam and Claire, it'd be great to hear a bit about the first steps. Um, and I know uh, for you, it was a lot also about bringing your family and people that you work with on the journey as well. And, and a collective sort of shift in mindset um, was really at the beginning. Yeah, I mean, certainly um, once we, once Sam and I had met Caroline um, and understood a lot more about what wilderculture was about. We then um, realized that any changes that we were going to make also had to have my parents buy in as well. So we um, I think we sneakily got Caroline in to do a talk for PFLA and brought, right, my, yeah. brought my mum along to yeah. it. <laughs> and, then, yeah. and then did the three day um, wilderculture basic training. Um, and it was kind of on that three days that we realized that world culture and um, a Gabriel Hall farm could work together. Um, but we also had to, um, sorry, <laughs> dog nosed in on us. Um, we also had, um, we brought in, so someone who's been working on our farm since my granddad almost, so he's been here sort of 40 years. So he came along on the course as well, because um, it was really important for him to understand what we we're doing and what changes we were making. Um, because almost on those first steps, we kind of, there was, a, there was a, quite a big build up to it, but you feel as though the first step was really kind of one day in, it was July or June or July, 2019, when it was that decision, are we going to cut that field for hay <laughs> or are we going to put the cows in it? And literally the mower was on the tractor ready to start mowing. Um, and we went, no, it stops. We're going to start our mob grazing. Um, that was almost, Kind of the first real kind of groundbreaking step um for us but there was quite a lot of build up to that i have to admit yeah there was and i mean so claire, i would say claire's parents on the whole have been incredible uh incredibly supportive throughout the whole thing but i do you know we there were you know difficult conversations and there were there have been times where you know clearly that the farm's starting to look different where what we're doing is is not the norm and so we do feel that uh, particularly you know we've got some fields that are right by the main road and we've got fields that are overlooked by kind of bungalows and, and you know we're always quite conscious about what people think uh, is going on you know and um i just remember you know the first couple of years that we were here and Anne used to ring me up and say have you ordered the fertilizer yet um and then I think that first Christmas we bought her um, wilding by Isabella Tree and she opened it on Christmas Day and her face was like, oh no, what's this? Not this, not this rewilding thing. And, um, but actually to, to her credit, she read the book and after that, she was like, it's quite interesting actually. And I think she really liked the, well, she really liked the pasture fed bit um, and the bit about how, you know, it's, it's healthier, uh, this is more natural there's not, none of these inputs that are required 
And because she was told when she was growing, when she was growing up, that she should not get involved in farming. It wasn't, wasn't worth her time. She was told to leave the farm, go and get a job as a solicitor um, in town. Um, and, you know, you could see that, you know, that, that, that this was new um, stuff that potentially would allow us to carry on economically. Um, whereas all the other possibilities seem to just only end in bankruptcy. So, <laughs> so um, that was quite a big moment too, I think. Um, and then, yeah, Neil, um, again, yeah, he has been incredible too, actually, since then. I mean, obviously there have there, been times where, you know, uh, we've had comments like, well, I wouldn't, I wouldn't feed that grass to my cows. Um, and that day, you know, when we suddenly decided we're not going to cut all that field for hay. It, 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 yeah, it, it did require him to sort of, uh, yeah, he just went to quiet actually at that point. <laughs> so. That's definitely a sort of status of openness and trying things and yeah, yeah, experimental, but it's, yeah, it's all of that social holistic context. It's everyone. Yeah, and, and I think that because he'd been through the, 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 the course, the kind of, he, he listened to mm. what Caroline had to say and, and he'd been in those discussions. He, he that was he was already sort of ready for, for that yeah oh, that's great um claire it'd be great to hear a bit from you as well about the training and i know you've got um also a big team at fai as well and um how you kind of brought everyone along and yeah i think um we're we're a a, a farm team of um it, it, it fluxes but about three um other than me um working on the farm and um, when we first started working with Caroline, I would definitely say she it's more than just training. It's more than learning information. It's it, it is the coaching bit that is key. It's not this is how you do mob raising. It's, oh, this is all going wrong. I don't know what to do next. What do you think we should do? Or everybody's questioning what we're doing. How do I stay firm? It's that coaching element that's so important. And that's the thing that's so hard to, you know, that's what's challenging to replicate because it isn't just a list. But um, for, for, for me, it was really important that we all did it together as a farm team. So I didn't just do the training on my own and then tell everybody what to do. We all we all did it together. And um, and that was uh, really, really interesting and not the approach of, of maybe every, that every farm would take, because it can feel like when you've got a whole day or half a day with everybody tied up doing training, that feels like a lot of time you know out of the farm but the, the value of that we, we just you just can't describe because it's hard enough doing it anyway um when we've all done the training i dread to think how it would have been if it was me saying oh no you're going to do it like this now and you're going to do it like that and we're going to change it it would have just been impossible and i can see why others really struggle when when they do when they do it like that but so we went we went on this journey together and um and, and how interesting it has been because we had some coming to it who were already more regen than me. You know, they were pushing me to do more. And we had some that were like, regen, what? What is that? Um, and, 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 and we all did it. And, and honestly, so fascinating that some of the people that had no idea what it was to start with are now the most, the most engaged and excited and, tra and transformed. Um, and and every, what that also is interesting is the way it happened just to, to, to observe it is that you would it wasn't just like a, everybody learned and we all got a bit it, it went up and down up and down and everybody questioned a bit and then they you revert back because you, you're not so sure so I don't know make one thing that we 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 really struggled with to start with all of us collectively was this um, concept of rest early in the season so the rest uh, up until then, our challenge had always been early turnout, early turnout. That's where that's when we're really doing well. As soon as we can get the cows out the shed on the grass, that's brilliant. And then, but I, and I try and say, actually, we're not going to put anything out on the on the summer grazing block until May time. We, we could we couldn't. None of us could get our heads around that. And we turned out. Um, we, so we turned out early in February, and we we're really proud of ourselves for some early grazing. But then, um, really quickly, we saw, oh right, now the grass isn't going to grow okay we see what we've done and for the rest of that year then we were doing regenerative grazing but on grass this long because it never came back um and yeah so it's just been it, it, I, I the value of the whole team doing it together would be one of the things that i'm so pleased that we made that decision and they didn't try to just scrimp and save on time um and, and to give it the time to do it because that that has been probably the one thing that has contributed to 
the pace at which we've been able to do the transition and the changes that we've made. Mm, that's great. So I'm really feeling like having the coaching and definitely having someone to bounce ideas around it helped to kind of accelerate your mindset change in a way um, and yeah, move it along faster. Yeah, we had um, we changed our sorry, Carla. We changed so you know, normally we'd have a weekly team meeting where we'd all look at the jobs needed doing and we tick off who's going to do what. So then it, that changed. We still did that, but then we had these additional sessions in the week that were just to reflect on our grazing planning. So we'd said we were going to put them here. How's it going? What's happening? And and it was like a, a forty-five minutes a week where we just reflected on where we were we moving them too soon not enough and and so yeah the nature of our conversation changed but it was definitely us all sitting there going I don't really know what to do but having everybody to talk about it and discuss it was really helpful and then as a backup when we really didn't know what to do then we bring Caroline and she yeah us. <laughs> then coming back to openness I think it's great yeah it'd be great to hear from you Caroline about also yeah, yeah. Um, helping people overcome a lot of these challenges and frustrations <laughs> Well, I hope I hope I can help in some way with that. But um, yeah, no, I would just also just reflect back that it's so important to get that. Nobody wants to do it, but it's so important to get the decision makers all around the, the, the table when you're doing the training and creating the context, because and, and it's uncomfortable and particularly with a lot of the big estates and things, you know, you've got multi generations and trying to get everybody there is really difficult. But if you don't, you inevitably, as Claire's really well you know, articulated, you you then you've got to try and convince them and that puts so much pressure on you as a, as a manager or owner or whatever and then almost in death you know almost it's just nearly always happens that some somebody will come and veto if they've got veto power will come and say well no I'm sorry we're not doing this anymore and, and all of your plans will be derailed and we don't give anywhere near enough emphasis on that kind of social piece you know it's all about you can have the best grazing plan in the world and you know and if somebody comes and it just doesn't work because the people are too stressed or too much under pressure or somebody comes and says no I'm sorry you can't go in that field you know this month because of this and you haven't given that enough thought then the whole thing just falls falls down so it's so important and as I say it's really difficult to get that happening but in my experience the farms that have had a team to work with or you know multi-generations that haven't done that we've we've definitely then later trained those people to try and get everybody on, on the same page and and it's so important to, to take the the kind of the feeling of I'm telling you what to do as a manager or an owner um, away and also take the pressure off that person and say right as a team we're collectively deciding what we're going to do here and and really help to foster this kind of experiment mindset where you're going in and saying oh right well this is the plan but we know it's not gonna as soon as that plan hits the ground it's gonna need adapting it's not that we've got a grazing plan that we think is going to be played out in that way not at all you you absolutely you you plan so that you can think of as many different eventualities as possible but then you expect it to change almost immediately you know um it's so so it's the process of collectively deciding how you're going to approach that coming back as, as Claire said to having some sort of meeting where you can all reflect and see what went well what didn't go well and it totally takes the pressure off that one person thinking that they've got to try and do it right you know there is no right it's purely a, an ongoing process of feedback and, and and observation and conversation and and then experimenting so yeah very different way of doing things but um both of those guys have done such a great job of getting everybody involved and and we've we've, we've done it I, yeah i spent a lot of time with sam and claire because it's a world of culture project you know in the early days and that sort of first year where you're getting all that social pressure and you most it's just not human nature that you will default to to kind of what you know and are comfortable with if you're under stress unless somebody else is around you so the more people we get you know transitioning to regenerative the better because it, the, the whole thing builds you've got more of a supportive community you can turn to other others for help and inspiration and that's where we need to get to so yeah it's good great um, and actually leading on into frameworks and decision making, it would be great to hear from you, Caroline, about um, social context um, and just explaining a bit about that. And then I'll hand it over to um, Sam and Claire and Claire to talk about their own context and how that helps them on the farm. Yeah, so um, at the beginning, it's, you know, I was explaining that you've got to have your context has got to include the social, the, you know, the ecological, which is kind of how do we, how are we improving those ecosystem processes, but it's also um, being very clear on, on what the landscape is that you're trying to create. So, you know, it's, it's, you're going to make different decisions about your management and how you apply your tools, i.e. your grazing animals and your time of rest and, and those sorts of things. If you're going to have a, you're trying to you know build towards a wood pasture than if you're trying to build towards a diverse you know um 
Hamid or, or whatever. So we've got to be very clear about, about that, obviously, and we are trying to regenerate the system. Um, but it's, yeah, it's got to stack up financially. So we've got to work out what does that then look at? You know, how does that work in terms of profit? But as I said, um, you know, a moment ago, the, the social piece is often hugely overlooked. We, we try and bypass it. And we see this in not just in farming, but in, in conservation projects, you know, these big rewilding projects that have failed um, or, you know, where we expect farmers just to follow prescriptions and pay paid money to farm in a particular way. If they're not on board with it, if they're not engaged with that idea, um, you know, money's a poor substitute for, for passion, you know. So it's really about trying to capture what are you passionate about and, um, and on what's going to get you up in bed you know this is a hard job isn't it farming you're out in the cold and the wet and and it's it's a struggle and you're being criticized from all angles all the time so if it's not if it's not something absolutely driving you to do that then it's it's going to be difficult and and the rates of depression and suicide in farming are, are demonstrating that we need to give this much more consideration and of course, traditional farmers really don't like to talk about this stuff. It's touchy feely. It's woo woo. And nobody thinks that this should matter. You know, it's, we just should just get up and get out and do this job. But it does matter. And um, so a great deal of part of the building of the context is around um, you know, understanding the values of the people and, you know, happiness in my, in my view and, and the research in sort of modern um, psychology is all around happiness is really a process of having some clear goals, knowing that you're probably never going to get there, but you're moving towards those goals um, and then and then acting in integrity with your values. So we do quite a lot of work around teasing out what are your values, what matters to you on the farm, what would you hate to never do again? You know, some people are just love lambing time or I've had farmers that just, you know, they love the culture of, you know, hay time and, and communities coming together. And of course that's changed a lot in modern farming, but you know, if you lose that, then that's sometimes these people that's, you know, a lot of the traditional farmers, particularly, they, they, do, they, they live in communities of other farmers. And if they then become alienated from that community, that's, a, that's very difficult, um, you know, whether you're, it's because you want you're in the Swaledale Breeders Association and you want to go to those sales and meet up with those amazing people you know we've got to take all of that into consideration so it's very much designing a system that um, absolutely has to regenerate we can't just keep the status quo and, de and degrade if that's what's been happening and um, but it's got to factor in you know what breeds are you interested on in you know what is it that um, drives drives those passions and gets you out of bed in the morning and, and we bake that into the to the holistic context so Great. Um, so Sam and Claire, it'd be great to hear a bit about your social context and what really drives you on the farm and your sort of experimental mindset. We are also going to talk about fails <laughs> and fail forward. So if you'd like to throw a fail in there and something that you learned from it and how that sort of changed your outlook, um, that would also be great. Yeah, I mean, just sort of um, echoing what Caroline or sort of adding to what Caroline was saying is that we are unquestionably happier doing what we're doing now um, and when we were building up that context um, there was definitely an element of what is making us unhappy at the moment um, what do we not enjoy about what we're doing and what do we enjoy and then um, kind of expanding on that and there was a big decision it was a difficult decision for us to, to stop sheep farming because there were as, as Caroline said we enjoyed lambing um, but there were quite a few elements of it that we didn't enjoy <laughs> so um it was definitely weighing up that so I, and then and then, you know towards the end as well when, when i was preparing them for the sale and things i was having quite a lot of wob like big wobble like wobbling moments where i was like oh well, let's just keep 50 you know let's just keep some of them oh i can't sell that one i remember that one you know mm -hmm. i caught it down in the back or whatever mm -hmm. and um yeah it was that that was a big challenge um and we just kept but we just kept discussing it yeah. together didn't we and there was an so element stuck with it we had the same problem as Claire was saying at the beginning of um we wanted um we appreciated that we we liked the cows and we wanted more cows and we were told that if we wanted cows we needed bigger sheds um because the shed we were having at the moment Sam was having to muck out twice a day and that was really tying us every day particularly during the winter and that was really short winter days um and we just didn't have the capital to buy those bigger sheds for our bigger herd um, so that kind of context of we need to work out how to outwinter our cows mm -hmm. on this farm um, were all elements that went into that kind of context that we built up so yeah it's definitely understanding our own social pressures but what what is achievable on this farm and how does that work and it the, the 
the answer that or the way in which we're farming just now seems obvious um but it, it took it took a while for us to sort of build up and understand kind of how it fits all together there was also the, the historical like i'm a bit of a history sort of nut and i look at the old maps and things of the farm try and work out whether you know maybe there was a way that it used to be managed that may be more appropriate now and um the, it turns out the whole farm used to be part of um what's called galbra park which was a deer park. And if you look at the maps going back to like 1490, it's shown as a kind of a ring fence with big, you know, vet, veteran trees that look suspiciously like oak trees on the map. And that basically would have been the entire farm. Um, and I just thought, well, perhaps this is a sort of landscape that we could try to recreate in at least part um, of the farm. And then we had, there is a slide actually of the, um, the broad habitat survey, which um, an ecologist did for us, and that really helped to kind of segment the farm into into kind of two main areas, and that is then kind of what fed into us building the, the grazing plan. And that's it. It's that one, and you see basically everything that's kind of uh, yellow or like an orangey yellow, um, and the green. The kind of woodland and then the kind of hashed bit on the top is the is the fell and basically everything uphill we decided we would we would rest during the summer and to allow natural regeneration of trees and all the sort of uh, wildflowers and grasses and everything to to really have a chance to fully um, recover uh, before we put and um, put the animals back up there in the winter and that I think that was a that was a kind of light bulb moment um, for us where, where we, we we realized we could just defer grass, which would then allow us to to keep everything outside. Um, and look, Rob um, Dixon from Wild Lakelands, who did this um, initial survey, he's been back to the farm um, quite a few times and he's, he's been on the culture training um, on the farm. And he as soon as he every um, saw what we we're doing, got quite excited. And so um, every time he comes on the farm, we go, we follow around, follow him around and go, what's this? What's going on here? And it's that learning process that we're really enjoying um, as well, just to sort of see from, from Rob what he's getting excited about. Um, and, and we're also getting excited about sharing it with him. So that's that's definitely an element that we're enjoying yeah. more now as well. Definitely. It's a new thing. Like he's obsessed with like melancholy thistle. It's like a I don't know why it's not even it doesn't even look that great to me but for some reason he's actually obsessed with this um thistle plant and so he's been putting it, 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 it just runs he just goes comes here and he brings all these like thistles and plants and stuff, so it's really good. can um, i just annie i love mel melancholy thistles as well <laughs> but, um, but yeah this process <laughs> well, they're very beautiful, and they're, they're like you just don't see them because you used to be a, whole, a hay meadow species, didn't they? They're amazing. But uh, yeah, but, um, yeah, this map is something that we do in the wilder culture training, isn't it, Sam and Claire? And um, and and I tend to to do this wherever I can, especially if you're working with different habitats. So we talked about the social, um, you know, piece of the context and 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 how important that is. And as Sam really nicely explained, you know, what what was really obvious here was that, you know, socially, the the, the there's two generations were sort of keen on a combination of rewilding and uh, and which fit with the the parkland as Sam was saying that kind of that that wood pasture type habitat was was very much kind of something that could be created and it would fit the the desire to have at least part of the farm so sort of looking like that more net style type of a rewilding and then of course um what this map helps you with is, is to understand which different areas of habitat um are going to be more palatable so it helps you to start to build out your grazing plan so the area at the bottom which is the pale improved grassland is all the kind of what would have been hay meadows so if you if you just opened up the whole block together then the animals will spend the majority of the time on that improved grassland and they will just if they're not managed with mob grazing they will just you know overgraze that area so it really helps to build out the the the, the initial sort of large scale plan and, and it also helps you to calculate what um you know, dry matter you're going to have over the as an overall package, if you like, to, to sort of start with working out whether you're overstocked or understocked. But it's a really good visual exercise, and it also helps 
um, make decisions along the line. Um, where's the huge expenses in, in maintaining infrastructure that we might want to avoid in the future? So it is this, this intercept between, yeah, creating your, the, your land plan and the ecology and how that's going to work with all the different animals that you might want involved in that, whether they're wild and, or unmanaged grazers. And then how does that create a landscape that we all want to see, considering all of the decision makers, including Sam and Claire and, and you know, Claire's parents, um, or, you know, might have slightly different ideas of what that might look like. Does it produce food, which is one of Sam's real passions? And, you know, um, you know, how does that work? Well, the improved grassland areas, the kind of engine of the of production on the farm and the rest of it supports that. Um, and then how does that stack up profitability wise? And that, of course, is kind of more detailed, you know, economic analysis. But that's how the three things tend to fit together. And it's a, a lovely way to show that. Sorry to interrupt you guys. <laughs> I'll just um, stop sharing that. Actually, it'd be great to um, throw it over to Claire um, to hear a bit about your social context at FAI as well. Yeah, well, in farming, when did we start thinking about our social context as part of what we do every day? And now it's something I think about all the time. But um, ours is... Um, uh we, 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 we're, we're different in a way but in fact we're the same as most most farms so although we don't we're not part of a family i have seven other shareholders um and in fact that i would say that we often argue more than brothers and sisters and families do um and and to start with i used to say that it was um you know i i, I was lucky because i didn't have that 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 family set up but actually i think it it's the same it's people with 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 thoughts and views and um the same thing in that not everybody is at the same same place on their journey so uh you know words like you're too regenerative um i don't know if you can be such a thing um but but those types of things because um and also because this this whole process is an unpicking of everybody's status quo that i was them uh three or four years ago i've come through a traditional um my dad was a farm manager although we don't have a family farm ourselves my mum was a farm secretary dad was a farm manager and I went to Harper Adams and so I've had a classic uh classic education and and then worked you know in and around agriculture ever since and so it's unpicking of it and that's been really interesting it, it and challenging like really really hard um and unpicking my own mindset but also those around and um one thing that's different Caroline mentioned earlier about the paradigm changing and one, one thing I think that I've realized has been um, one of our hardest things is because on the farm, we've had all this great training, we've worked with Caroline and our paradigm has changed, but we're part of a business who's, who's um, hasn't had the same exposure. So then you, uh, everything goes along for a while and then you realize that actually your goals are different. So there's something for me and alert, this is a fail forward thing as well in a learning that, um, uh, and actually I'm, I'm, I've, lucky enough to have an opportunity to do it do another project um over in shropshire and my husband and family and i are moving over here um to a small farm and um, to take this on a, on a similar journey um as well as continuing with my work at fai and um, that's my biggest thing now is like i need to make sure that everyone that's involved in this all of the stakeholders understand that we're we're setting uh, new goals here even as much as the setting up the small shareholder agreement that we have it's it's not just financial goals that are in there in a club i'm saying to the solicitor we need more and he's like just i don't know why what what <laughs> we're having a really interesting conversation i was like no no it needs to be that our um you know for example we maintain pfla certification every year or our score on our um, savory eov increases by five percent each year that needs to be a target and we are measured on those things because when you are only measured on financial goals it won't always stack up to be the best but you're delivering on everything else which is so important and when you get into that headspace and then you get chat you're like can't you see and of course no they can't see because we're, we're not part of the same paradigm so that's been a really interesting one and then taking it down to a bit more day-to-day -day farm level is that um people will have heard me say before but like our landlord wrote to us in our first year to tell us that our we were in breach of our tenancy because our farm was no longer in good agricultural order so when it was being topped and trimmed and we're not we're not we're organic so we're not spraying all the time but you know when we were doing that carbon heavy management that was like big tick and then when we started being more environmentally friendly improving the condition of soil doing everything that of course should 
to be exactly what our landlord would want they were like no luckily we talked to them they understand now and that, that you know that's been that that's been good but that would be another thing is 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 it, uh, maybe a fail that i didn't go out there proactively to start with but you're quite scared because every time you mention any of this stuff to start with people are you just got so many people ready to tell you why it's wrong and not going to work and you know, blah 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 so you you tend to go into a shell a bit and um and that well, i see there's some some chat on here about networks and from when i started doing this and thinking like this a lot's moved on and there are a lot more networks but that is for a while i've had to kind of make yeah make new farming friends to talk to about this stuff because if it, i would have given up if i'd have just talked to the people that i was talking to before um so um the other bit that's made me made me understand a lot more about this on from a social point of view is that that family and people aspect so caroline and i working on something at the moment and we're asking farmers to consider themselves as the most important asset of the farm so what do you want to get out of bed for in the morning what do you add do you actually want to have a racehorse yard do you actually want a housing estate do you want to rewild it if it was just you and your decision what what gets you out of bed and let's shape your business around that just because you are a dairy farm now um maybe that's not 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 forever it might be you want to do more dairy and that's great but let's just ask ourselves that question because how often do we do that and and the impact of our day-to-day -day farming on our on our family like how often do we hear um oh yeah the, you know the marriage is breaking down things aren't wife's left husband's left whatever things are tough and everybody puts the farm first and that's um you know should we be doing that so just i've, I've thought i think a lot more just about the impact on my own family um of, of what we're doing with the farm but also um on the families you know working on the farm and making sure we're factoring those things in tight prop we've always been good at fairly good at proper time off but really recognizing those things as important and not creating a culture where people feel like they're having to work all of the time in order to deliver so sorry a long reflection but a reflection no. social <laughs> reflection very important uh, that was really good um i think if we take it over to caroline to talk a little bit about um the stages of transition as well because i know that we've um had a conversation about kind of how those first steps um where you're kind of looking at soil and carbon and then and then for moving on into kind of more optimal stages um where you're really fine tuning things that you're doing um and then uh this sort of different set of metrics so i know claire you kind of mentioned it there like the the goals the kpis the things that you're looking at now in terms of your regenerative mindset versus kind of maybe before yeah and i think what claire said actually is a really a great starting point on that which is that you mentioned it earlier as well that you it's not linear like you go through these waves and stages of of like you get it for a bit and then you come under pressure or you're surrounded by people that are naysayers and then you reverse back to where you were and then you move a bit further forward and and if you've got a team and a family and they're all doing that at different stages you can imagine how how challenging that is and um i think one thing that i see underestimated all the time in tra early transition is how much um, pressure and stress there is around shifting your mindset as well as your system farming system so you know you not only are you trying to think differently look differently and manage that differently your animals are adjusting they're having a whole new type of they might be going to out wintry for the first time they might be you might be shifting to new breeds you might be adopting the new grazing system that's very different um you know and your land is moving it potentially it might be coming you know withdrawing from you know fertilizer use or whatever it is it's going to be shifting the, the and adjusting and healing and um in that early stage process i think often we're lured into seeing these people you know the gabe brands and richard perkins and people that are doing these amazing things that inspire us all and that's why we're kind of moving in this direction often and, that, and that's brilliant but they are like 10 15 years along their journey and they have gone through this gentle moving shifting adapting process and we assume that we can jump straight to where they are and we often go in and, and have you know try and set up multiple enterprises and we move we often think about moving the, the our existing numbers of livestock straight into a regenerative system and work out how we can do that and there's so much focus on oh we can double our output and you know um increase our profitability that we want to get straight there and, and i feel uh, in my work what i try and do and it's not always popular <laughs> um is to really simplify i call it simplifying the battlefield and and giving full weight to how much pressure there's going to be on the people and as I say all these other th factors so in the we, i think of it as phase one and phase two transition so phase one is the 
and sometimes phase one will take a long time and, and don't get me wrong we're, we're still in early days with all of the forms that I work with but um, phase one is really about creating the simplest possible plan you can um, and, and, and actually just really trying to deliver on that, you know, and, and still expecting it not to go to plan because it won't. Um, but, you know, really, really simplifying it so that you just getting the hang of this new system. The animals are adjusting, paying a lot of attention to observing, sitting, watching the cows and them grazing. How are they adapting to this new way of doing things? Um, and, you know, get, researching, spending time talking to people, allowing yourself that time to go and see other people and be inspired, you know, watch the YouTube videos and all of that stuff that's going to help you build that mindset that's that's looking at things differently. Um, so creating the space in your farming management. And, and if we have a subsidy system that can allow that to happen, Happen because on many farms I work with, the productivity isn't the bit that's, you know, this, that isn't actually making the, the, the animal sales as a unit separated out from the overheads is not necessarily very profitable. It's that, you know, the whole farm might work or not, but often um, reducing your livestock numbers doesn't necessarily mean that you're going to be uh, less profitable in many cases it's the opposite so you know being really realistic about that so separating off your overheads and then looking at your different enterprises and working out where you can make those changes and if you have got an opportunity to leverage rest by reducing animals down for a wee while then I would definitely encourage people to do that and and as I say it doesn't mean that has to be the case forever but we have farming systems that have got a lot of ghost acres I call them ghost acres where you're buying in feed and you're buying in fertility and many people have never really understood or found out where their actual baseline is in terms of how many animals can that farm actually sustain so often we want to try and get to the point where we really know that this farm absolutely can sustain these number of animals all throughout the year and if you do want to have more animals we need to understand what the gap is and where we're going to get that gap covered you know whether that's buying in or, or whatever so we really try and um, simplify the battlefield make um, and support people in that early transition and that's phase one often we get criticized in that phase because it's like well it's all right for you you've got 900 acres and only, only got you know 60 cows or whatever but it's really about in in a non-brittle part of the world where we've got humidity all year round rest is an unbelievably powerful tool so if we can allow um lots of deep roots tall grass um a, a lot of the soils we're working with are bacterial dominant so when we get lignified material it might not look that highly productive but if we're trampling that in we're building the fungi levels we're feeding the soil we're kickstarting the all of the soil food web so it can start to kind of um bring in those nutrients that haven't been able to be brought in before so we see magical changes in that first year or two of like super long rest periods and, and then the phase two is then okay we all feel a bit more comfortable we're a bit more confident we, we know got the right number of animals for the farm or we've got too few often um now what do we do then we can optimize and you know really get our grazing planning um singing we can start to stack enterprises bring in other things um uh, and try you know try stuff so i think that's how i tend to work with people i really do like this phase one phase two um way of doing things so yeah i hope that explains it great um and one thing actually that i think we've all talked about a bit is are the indicators of the change and the things that you um look at so in terms of what you monitor on the farm and your kind of visual feedback um so at, at soil mentor we have a set of um regenerative indicators that we've worked with nicole masters um, who's a soil specialist um over in the us and new zealand and australia um to produce and uh, i'm i'm going to share a slide to show you what the regen indicators are um we've never shared this before so it's quite exciting to share it all with you and and also um would be great uh to hear from you, Caroline, about the different things that you look to monitor with the farms that you work with. Um, and then I'll hand it over to Sam and Claire and Claire to hear about some of the indications that you've seen that have really made you think that have helped to shift your mindset. Um, so I'll just share this, uh, share my screen again. Um, so we've got 10 regen um, indicators uh, and some of them may look familiar and some of them uh, may be quite new, um, but these are all um, different soil tests that you can do on your farm, which are about becoming very in tune with your land um, and learning this way of kind of observing and getting feedback from your ecosystem. Um, so I've done quite a few of these tests on the farms uh, where I um, work and live. My family also farm and um, I can say counting earthworms is really fun. And also one of the best ways to get a really good understanding of um, biological activity in your soil. 
um, and looking for soil insects at the same time is also quite fun because there's lots of things that you might not know what they are, but you can take photographs and check out um, later and that's as Caroline mentioned earlier where some specialist help and input as well can be really useful to figure these things out um, so these are the 10 different indicators and they sort of give a good broad brush of um, your regenerative transition um, and it'd be great to hear from uh, Caroline um, some of the different indicators that you look for with the farms that you work with. Yeah no th these are so good and I think so many um, farms, when you start working with them, they don't want to do the survey work. They want, but in actual fact, they often want to get somebody in to do it. And it's absolutely essential as much as it's, you know, it's hard work and it's finding the time. It's always the thing that's the least priority. But um, it almost doesn't matter which of these indicators you use. It's all, it's really about trying to encourage people, you know, it, some, some people's context is that it's important that we have, you know, verification of what we're doing and you know Claire and I on the some of the projects you know we work on and also the, the transition at, to FAI involved I think was it Claire was it like 50 metrics we've been monitoring uh, certainly on the McDonald's project so a huge number of metrics and absolutely includes all of these um so you know the, it depends on the context of what you want to do but at the very very least I want to at least encourage farmers to go out and, and look at the ecosystem processes on the soil surface. So for me, um, the soil tests are absolutely essential and, and brilliant. Um, but the first thing that we want to do is just get people's eyes into what does a healthy ecosystem look at the soil surface. It's where the first indicators show up. And some people sort of discount that as being a bit too simple. But in actual fact, the more I understand about what's going on in the soil, the more I realise that these surface level indicators are actually the, the way to, to go. Um, so the first thing we look at is kind of, yeah, your plant density, how is it the photosynthesis, you know, the mineral cycling evidence of insects and, you know, all of the stuff that we, we all know about on the on the soil infiltration rates you know and um, you know but you can see that as well how, how you can you can start to get your eye into what that would visually look like on the soil surface and we should be monitoring very informally about what's happening looking at your livestock watching how they behave making you know just looking at how they, their outline looks in terms of health and all of that stuff is really excellent um just general observation developing your observation skills but I think these tools here, Annie, are absolutely fantastic because you're 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 encouraging and, and you're forcing people to get their hands in the earth and smell it and understand it and cross-reference it with other things that they're looking at at the same time. And um, it's a great way to do that. And, and you know, of course, depending on the, the, the needs of the project, etc., we, we'd be looking at soil testing and chemistry and biology and you, but you know there's a huge cost to those tests and um if that's of interest to you that's great but you don't need to i mean some of the best regenerative farmers in the on the planet are are you know the the, the real traditional farmers or the indigenous people they didn't have any of those tools available to them they just really understood deeply what was happening in their own environment so we don't need to do those expensive things and these are a great sort of middle ground you've got it's slightly objective and you can use things like pictures and stuff to go back and look at but you're also just getting to know what's happening on your land and I think that's that's for me the big most important piece of this yeah great yeah it's like seeing the farm almost through different eyes different glasses <laughs> and um getting really in tune with actually seeing what's happening and observing and learning it's it's really exciting um Sam and Claire, it'd be great to hear from you um, a bit about your experience of, of your kind of observation and um, the power of that and um, the different observations that you've made, maybe through the guise of different indicators like infiltration rates and how that's changed your mindset. Yeah, so we um, uh, sort of uh, after talking to Caroline and sort of um, thinking about the, the, the way the farm might be, might be managed so going forward, we started digging quite a lot of holes uh, everywhere. Um, and it was just fascinating, like looking at areas that had been grazed, areas that hadn't been grazed, um, and, and areas that had been cut, you know, for hay and driven on with a tractor, and comparing that with a with an area that hadn't, you know, uh, and just just starting to see the difference in in species of grass um, above ground, and you know the root depth and things. And you know, the, the more I looked at it, the more I could see that these long rests that we were that, that we're now um, using. So we're we're using rest periods of sort of 100 and, 
well, up to about 120 days uh, this summer we had. And that is really allowing things like cox foot um, to sort of start to thrive. And it's a deeper rooting grass. So we're, we're getting better aggregation. And as a result, <clears throat> I think we're, well, we're, we are seeing better infiltration at faster water infiltration rates. We started taking uh, infiltration rates in 2019. And the, the field where we, we first started mob grazing, um, we did a test in 2019 on a, a litre of water poured into a six inch drain, drainage ring. And it, the, the water just stood there for sort of five minutes. It didn't, it didn't go in. Um, and then I just got bored and, uh, and walked away from it. But I did it again this year, the same time of year, um, in exactly the same place. And it took 14 seconds and all the water had gone. Um, and just, just looking at the photos on the, on the soil mentor, you can see the, the, the difference between the kind of, uh, you know, the slab of clay that we started with and now the kind of, uh, you know, more aggregated, um, darker looking soil. So, I'm, you know, there, there's definitely changes occurring, but I think that the quickest and best thing I would say is just, just start like digging holes and, and start looking at places where you think, Oh, that looks really good, and maybe that doesn't look so good. Let's try and find out why and think about how we might manage it uh, differently. The infiltration rates, I think, is, is a particularly hot topic um, for where we live because our, our valley has suffered from quite a lot of flooding. And obviously, if, if the water's not going into the soil, it's rushing straight off our fields into the lake, um, and that's kind of um, been one of the, possibly one of the big factors that have caused things like Pooley Bridge being, being completely destroyed um, uh, this decade or last decade. So um, that was one of the actually one of the things that really convinced my mum while we were doing um, was one of the triggers, in fact, the infiltration is we looked at different parts of the farm and how different parts of the farm had historically been managed. And we could see that those that had had sort of set stop, constant grazing, short grass, exposed soils. The water just wasn't filtering away. Um, but those areas where they'd had the longer rest periods, that there was filtration. So it's it's a really easy one to do if you can look at your different parts of your farm and how they've been managed and just see the differences that there are in the soils just from that infiltration rate. But the same, um, we're, we're quite focused on um, species richness of our um, fields as well, because we're well aware that um, having a diverse um, diverse diet for our animals is quite key um, for them as well as us. Um, and that same field that um, Sam was saying that um, he'd had a huge change in the infiltration um, has the species count, um, square meter species count has gone from a few a handful to 14 um, in the space of two years, um, which is, is purely been from our grazing management. So that um, is another great indicator that what we feel that um, what we're doing is the right thing. Great, yeah. yeah. The species richness that plays into the, so in the regen indicators, it's called the basal cover, a uh, basal ground cover transect. So ah, um, I did, I did wonder. Yeah. I was going to say, Annie, where's the species richness indicator? No, it's a translation. So um, <laughs> the regen indicators bring together um, some of the tests that we've had in Solmenter before, and um, the basal ground cover transect is where you have. Um, a sort of 60 meter stretch and you monitor every meter what plant is there so forbs um, legumes grasses and you start to get a picture of the above ground biodiversity um, and yeah this is the way that Nicole Masters monitors it and um, it's how it's going to um, then play in with her benchmarks so we can support farmers with um, yeah looking at these different indicators and seeing where they are on the journey and moving forward. Um, be great to hand over to Claire um, and hear a bit about your uh, experiences with indicators and how they've changed your mindset. Yeah, and I'm also going to, as part of my answer, pick up on one of the questions, which is um, about organic and regenerative and what whether there's a difference, because um, they kind of tie in together. So we've been organic for 20 years almost, and um, 
before we started this, we couldn't quite describe it, but the soil just felt a bit dead. There was always standing water around um, in the winter and then it's dry as anything in the summer. Everyone would describe our farm as one that's wet in winter and dries off in summer. Where a proportion of the farm is on, on the floodplain, so that would make sense. But even on the non-floodplain bits, it's just sort of surface water all the time. And um, it was it was really that, it's the water that, that, that's got me. And that's often what you hear others say. It was, um, it, it floods every year is the worst flood we ever have. And then um, I was, um, our sh shepherd got COVID uh, during lambing um, a couple of years ago. So I was like properly full back on lambing and I was, it, we had cracks in the ground in April. And I was like, we've only just come out of the worst flood we've ever had. How, how can this be? So for me, uh, infiltration rate was one of the most interesting because I had, um, we had parkland permanent pasture for, um, for, for 20 years, managed organically, doing an infiltration rate test which is of course to replicate when it rains how does the rain soak into the ground and I realized that where we had permanent pasture and it was taking um up to 45 minutes for 400 500 mil half a liter of water to soak in I was like oh so when it rains it doesn't soak in it just runs off so then why, why is it so dry in spring because probably because it's not soaked in like so hard, so some of it's really not soaked in or it's soaked in and it's saturated in like a top level but if you dig down it's actually dry it's not soaking in so even though we're that so that would be one of my things about we we, we we're soil association certified we follow all the rules we do it right but there's something more that there's I, I can't describe it just quite describe it there's something more than being um to being organic now not saying that there aren't organic farmers out there as it will be conventional farmers managing their soil in this incredibly proactive way but it doesn't yet it's about soil protection environmental protection it's not about proactive regeneration and that's i think the difference between um between the 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 the, the different ways of management the two of course what what are completely in line what we saw caroline predicted and i think is what we've seen is an incredibly quick um an incredibly quick improvement in our land because we didn't have to do that kind of weaning ourselves off pesticides and fertilizers and everything else so we already had almost like everything ready to go and and just a change in the management in the way we grazed has kick-started everything so it's all gone exploding um and that um and, and that was so that would be um that that would be infiltration rate but that recognizing how well the rain soaks into my land has been the biggest um, one but also all of them um are useful so people often in in and in, in, in what i do they just well what what's the two things so tell me one thing just what do i measure i'll just do that and, and that'll be fine well of course one thing doesn't tell you everything so if you do infiltration rate you're seeing how well the, the water's soaking in but then you want to do a slake test so that you understand the water holding capacity of the soil and you might want to do it at different depths to understand you know have you got layers of compaction and things like that um soil insect score is a really interesting one to see on here so we have been doing earthworm counts of which i'm um I, we see real variability. So I, I, because we're so dry and so wet, I think um, that one, again, if you just did that in isolation, you might find no earthworms and assume you're terrible, or you might find loads because of the weather on that day. It's like piece of a puzzle. The soil insect score is one that in year one, we would, I would have not really known what that meant, but when we've done our tests in year two, you're digging into the ground and there's all these things like, what's that? What's that? What's that? All this stuff wriggling around. So I had no way of knowing, but now I'm seeing soil insect score on here. That's great. And one thing I've stayed really focused on, people often ask me about um, what species of this and what species of that and what grass is this. And I admit I can recognize about three. I'm terrible. Same with birds, same with everything else. And I just go with the, uh, the kind of rule of abundance. Like if I see lots of different things, then that's good. And I'm not really worried about what it is. Um, it's just about seeing lots of different things. But what this, <laughs> sorry, what this test do is just give us, uh, I know there's some questions coming up, which is really interesting on the chat that are saying, well, what even are these? Like I've never heard of these words. 
And that's just, that's so interesting in itself. And I was exactly the same a few years ago. But what they do is they give us a different lens and, and maybe some of our problems have come from the fact that we're not looking at slate or bricks, which is the sort of energy level in the, in the plant. We're all obsessed on how much nitrogen do we get on our test and how much do we therefore need to apply. We're not looking at all of measuring how much sunlight or water we're getting because ultimately those are the free things, aren't they? We don't pay for those sunlight and water and carbon and in the soil. And um, if we if we start to look at our profitability from how much of our profit comes from those things, rather than how well we're turning our nitrogen fertilizer into more profit, then that's that that's what changes the game when we look at regenerative mm -hmm. management. Yeah, case in point, mindset shift from looking at sunlight and water and integrating those into your system. That's yeah, that's such good insight. Um, I'm just going to quickly show a slide of the um, Regen platform, which I hope um, will then also put a lot of these metrics into a more um, sort of uh, understandable lens. So this is something that we're launching at Soil Mentor this month, and it's a way of um, benchmarking the metrics. So for all the results that you get when you do the soil tests and look at the indicators on your farm, um, we've worked with Nicole Masters to come up with a traffic light system. So sort of red, amber, and green, green being a good result and red being something that needs um, to be looked at um, and sort of considered um, more quickly than the others. Um, and through this uh, platform, Nicole shares her suggestions um, and considerations so that you can start the questioning that we've spoken about so much today um, about what's happening on the farm and then use that to make um, a decision on what to do next. Um, and often it's great to be able to work with coaches, but also having um, other tools. And you know, if you can't always work with a coach straight away, being able to look at these results and the benchmarks and use that as a touch point um, for your feedback um, is it can be a really helpful tool in your regenerative transition and moving your mindset to sort of in a different way. Um, so this is almost like turning the kind of observations that you make when you're out and about and seeing all those exciting wiggly insects in the soil and thinking, oh, this is great, but what does it mean? This this makes it, you know, turns it into something with a bit more meaning and understanding. So it's a tool to support that. Sorry, my dog is getting excited and getting involved. <laughs> um, so yeah, I just wanted to share a bit about this. And um, if you're interested to learn more about it, you can also see more at the Soil Mentor website. Um, so I'm going to stop sharing my screen. I'm aware we've got about 12 minutes left. Um, the, the last thing that we were going to cover was a bit about how um, our regenerative mindsets have kind of infiltrated into the rest of our lives. Um, but also it would be good to have a look at the Q&A and just cover some questions too that we've had. Um, so I don't know if you each want to quickly say a little bit about um, your mindset um, and it's sort of um in into your wider life and and we'll take a couple of questions after that yeah no absolutely it doesn't stop at farming once you've changed your mindset you've changed it in every part of the world and and in your world and um and and i, I yeah I, I study this quite a lot and there's lots of different sort of versions of it but essentially it's kind of like the human emergence models looking at how does people's worldview shift and there's predictable patterns and we can understand that to some degree and that really helps me frame the different training depending on whom I'm working with I can get a sense of how they're looking at the world and you know what's you know how to support that transition um but something that is just uh, I've already said and just to recap on is that just the more people that we get in this movement and supporting each other and having these conversations the easier it's going to be on everyone because it's the it's the most lonely difficult thing in the world if you're the only one out there looking at the world in that way and I think most of us that have gone through on this journey have found that at some point um so having other people we can talk to and um it, it's just incredibly important so i just want to see much more of that which is great and, and it's happening it's really great great um yeah it'd be great to hear um from you sam and claire yeah a little bit about how the mindset has moved into your your life as a whole <laughs> and moving away from competition and more into sort of collaboration and community well yeah that's a good that's a that's a good point because i suppose well often farmers kind of see that they're kind of competing with one another and I suppose they they, they kind of are in a way but then and I, and I myself sometimes think oh you know we've got neighbours that are kind of doing things similarly and are they are we are we trying to you know are we treading on each other's toes and things but I think now I try and I try to see it is that just everyone's 
working together, collaborating, and instead of yeah, instead of competing, can we can we instead collaborate and help to to sort of transition more farms? Yeah, and it's, a, it's such a strong message that you that kind of we want to get out. Um, that we're always going to be louder talking together about it. Um, so I think, I mean, we we are all for sharing what we're doing um, with other people. And there was a question, you know, earlier about what the other farmers um, around us are thinking. I mean, we we are, um, I feel as though we're quite lucky in the sort of Oldswater Matterdale community that um, there's, a, there's a lot of us with quite similar thinking um, and we're sharing ideas. Um, there's quite a few um, people that uh, kind of get us all together. Um, and I think even those who are not sort of fully, um, I wouldn't say have taken the full big step to regenerative farming, are definitely talking to each other and us about um, how you can improve practices. So I think we're in general um, quite positive um, talking with the farms and sharing what we're doing. Um, but I think one of the something slightly different of shifting your mindset is um, with often with regenerative farming, you don't think about well, often with farming, what you're doing is, is treating symptoms. Whereas um, one of our big steps was looking at causes. What what if we have a problem on the farm, what ultimately is causing it um, and, and how how you can fit something else into your farm that's often not chemical that, can, that might fix this problem and um, quite often I think that can be reflected into um, into life as well I would say. Yeah I think more you know more diversity of species mm. plants and animals you know working together um, can only be a good thing yeah. Yeah yeah diversity definitely all elements of life I think that's so for me what I've sort of taken a lot away from my regenerative mindset is kind of looking for that everywhere. <laughs> Abundance, diversity, such amazing words, I think. Um, Claire, it would be great to hear a bit from you as well about your mindset shift. I know that you've got some really interesting thoughts on this. Oh, yeah, and I hope I'm going to say the right things now, Anif, what you're e expecting um, me to say. But um, one book that I'm really enjoying at the moment is One Wild and Precious Life um, by Sarah Wildman. And it's really resonated with me because she says um, you can't unsee this stuff. Once you start seeing it, you can't unsee it. You can't go back. Um, I, I, I set the challenge always to say, find, I'd love to meet a farmer that tried regenerative stuff and then went back to um, conventional uh green revolution uh, at style agriculture and um and and i think that's it so once you start to see it you see there's a different way then um and that and that's that that does start to filter um in into life um and you start to become more concerned and notice things that are happening around you like the farmer's field next door to us that is on a slope is plowed every year and every year the what it's, it's it's barren every winter and every year the soil washes off and down the road and then you kind of look that up and you realize that we lose whatever percentage of topsoil and you you you, you start to think about these things in a more serious way um yes patrick i will in a second um then the um the 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 other part of it is that i think we've all felt through these last few years is is just with COVID is what what's mostly important and personal resilience and building time in for that, um, which because we, we start, I think regenerative agriculture has opened that up for something for me to start to think about for myself and, 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 and how do I do that? How do I make time? And we've all seen um, weirdly, although I work on, you know, in, in and around farming, how much do I actually go outside and appreciate that nature all around me or how often is it like gotta get there get here get there check there move that do this um you know it's 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 a mission all the time it's a mission and that's something that I'm um well Caroline is coaching me in this but is 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 just you know the, the mindfulness side of things and um and that's something that is, is a long way to go for me but that's something I'm really trying to build in and appreciate things in a different way even just having uh, I take my I go to, we've got a little brook here and I go down and it's not quite cold water swimming but it's uh, take my shoes and socks off and stand in the brook for a few minutes and just um, anybody that's followed uh, anything on cold water swimming it's one of the benefits 
benefits of it's just that you can't think about anything else because all you can focus on is your breathing the moment and it creates mindful a mindful moment that you don't it's so hard to get in our busy lives and I think um I, I I've always had a slight interest in this stuff but I've never really done it but but the the thinking in a more regenerative way has has given me the tools and opened my eyes to seeing a different way of, of, of doing it yeah great yeah that I totally see where you're coming from I I feel so the same on the farm when I'm walking around as well that really mindful connection when you start to observe and look and you're not stressed about getting from A to B and there's mud everywhere and uh, panic but when you just uh, take a breath I think I'm definitely guilty of forgetting to breathe regularly <laughs> and actually that's the other brilliant thing about being on the farm and you know you, you sort of just feel like you're almost breathing everything in the hedges and the trees and the landscape yeah. it's it's really special and I would just add as well to, to Sam and Claire's point earlier about life is happier that you know we I am happier there's lots of other stresses that come with it but generally it's that being excited about your farm being excited what's happening and feeling really optimistic and just being happier not feeling burdened by it that's a word I used to describe burdened by the treadmill of praying it would be better next year and we don't have that and, and one example Humphrey um who, who used to work with us who's now farms just in Wales says it is last spring when it was like dry drought spring everyone's feeding out stress really cold and he said isn't it amazing we're like repairing fences we're prepping for stuff and we haven't got any of that stress just that not having three months of stress in the spring was is enough to change people's lives that was amazing and so it's made some really fundamental changes to to the way in which we operate yeah that's great and um, we've just got a few minutes left and there was one question in the in the q a that would be great to cover with caroline just on working with arable farmers and if you have any experience of, of that and um, the difference in their journey um, um, in comparison to maybe some of the examples that we've had today? Yeah, sure. I don't generally work with arable farmers and that's because I've got not, absolutely nothing against that. It's just I've not, that's not my area of expertise. So I haven't generally, you know, gravitated towards that. And, I, and because I'm quite a lot further up north and I spend a lot of time in Scotland, I generally work with the kind of upland environments, but it really is the same process. Um, and, and actually, it's sometimes even helpful not to, um, not to be an expert in what, what you're working with that person on, because you you then don't come with that kind of pre, you know, you, that, that those preconceived ideas and, and sort of understanding of things. You haven't come through those pathways, so you can start to question things in a different way. So um, really, actually, this, yeah, working with the holistic management framework and working with the individuals is, is the same process. It's understanding the principles, coaching and helping them design a system that's right for them, and then helping them question their decisions along the way. So it can work for any type of farming. It's definitely the same process yeah that's great um and great oh we've got two minutes left so we can keep going for another two minutes <laughs> i just posted our contacts also in the chat in case anyone um is interested in following up on the conversation but um also just wanted to take uh, a quick moment just to say thank you very much to all of our wonderful panelists um and um also um to joy who's been helping in the background and Paige as well um to facilitate this session and make sure rfc is all running smoothly um but it's it's been great and thank you so much to everyone who's joined it's super exciting to see you all there and also early on friday morning um so no i just hope that everyone's really enjoyed this and found it insightful and interesting um and yeah it's been great to um have a platform to share um some of these thoughts and feelings um around farming because as you said it, it's it, it can be tough and it's so good to know that there are lots of people out there um who are going through the same challenges but also finding the real joy and beauty and excitement and the drive and the reasons that they get up and get out of bed and um, do things on the farm every day so thank you so much to everyone for for being part of this yeah and thanks Annie for organizing it and thanks to everyone that's joined and uh, I hope yeah I hope it's been useful really appreciate you being here yeah thanks everyone thank you. thanks Annie <laughs>